there are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Baylis Conley. You know, sometimes I tend to shy away from teaching certain subjects because there's excess. Some people have taken a truth too far. And when it comes to generosity, prosperity, by nature, I tend to want to retreat from it. However, the scripture is very clear along some of these lines. I pray that you would stay tuned and hear what I think is a balanced message. You know, after the floodwaters abated, and the ark came to rest upon Mount Ararat, and Noah and his family came out from the ark, an interesting thing happened. God started talking to himself. It actually says that the Lord said in his heart, and God made a declaration in his own heart that I want to quote to you. It's in Genesis 8 and 22. Listen to what the Lord said in his heart. He said, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Sowing and reaping is a principle that God established, and he has decreed that as long as the earth remains, the principle will operate. Seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping, plant seeds in the earth and they will grow and they will multiply. If you take a single kernel of corn in between your fingers, it looks quite small. But you know what? When you plant that in the earth, it grows. And a, a stalk of corn comes up with one or two ears on it. And each of those ears produces generally between six and eight hundred kernels of corn. Seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping. You sow it in the earth, it grows, and what comes back is multiplied. But interestingly enough, in the scripture, this principle is used in connection with more than just physical, natural seeds. God's word is referred to as a seed. In Mark 4, Jesus said it. The seed is the word of God, and he said the sower sows the word. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm casting out seed. Some people will receive it. They will meditate upon it. They will embrace it, and it will find its way down into the soil of their heart. It will grow, and it will produce a multiplied harvest in their lives. So the, the principle of seed time and harvest or sowing and reaping is used in the Bible in connection with God's word. It is also used in connection with the words that we speak as a habit of life. The things that you say daily that come out of your mouth from your heart will produce a harvest in your life for positive or negative, if you speak words of doubt and, and fear and, and lack and, and negativity, you will reap a negative harvest. In other words, your words are like seeds that will produce a harvest or fruit in your life for good or bad. The deeds of people are referred to as seeds, the things that people do. In Galatians 6 and 7, don't be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And if you look at it, it's in connection with our actions. People are referred to as seeds. That great parable that Christ taught in Matthew 13, where the, 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 the wheat and the tares were there, and the, the, you know, the farmers came out and they went to the master and said, didn't you plant good seed in your field? He said, well, an enemy has done this. That's where the tares came from. And then when Jesus explained it to the disciples, he said, listen, the wheat, the good seeds, they are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares, the evil seed, they're the sons of the wicked one. And the idea is that whenever God or the devil wants to bring influence into a particular culture or region of the world or place, they do it by sowing people. 
people that have embraced the word of God and been changed by God, God will then take that person and sow them into a particular environment or people group or place in the world to affect change. And a multiplication begins to happen. It's a wonderful strategy. But people are referred to as seeds in the same principle of sowing and reaping refers to people. But you know what? In the scripture, it also refers to money. That is giving our resources into kingdom work. Giving to God's house into the church is referred to as planting seed. And this same principle of seed time and harvest or sowing and reaping is applicable. In fact, look with me in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I want to begin in verse 1. 2 Corinthians 8 and 1. Paul is writing to this church in Corinth, and he says, And now, brothers... We want you to know about the grace of God, the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving, And he was talking about a particular offering they were receiving to help the church in Jerusalem. The saints in Jerusalem were being persecuted. They were in a season of lack. And so that's what this offering was for. It could have been, however, for any kingdom work. But that's just what this specific one was for. And he goes on talking about this offering that they're going to collect from the church in Corinth. And look with me in chapter 9, if you would, as he continues with the theme. Verse 5 of chapter 9. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Now here we go. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, that's a lot of alls, you will abound in every good work. And I like the Message Bible there. It says, and God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways, so that you're ready for anything and everything. But that is brought about by generous giving. What preceded the fact of God pouring out the blessing in astonishing ways was sowing generously in order that there might be a generous harvest. So the principle of sowing and reaping and multiplication applies to the resources we give into God's kingdom. And I just want to share a very simple message with you today. I'm going to use the word seed as an acrostic. Very simple. There'll be four points. And you will know when I'm getting towards the end of the sermon if you can spell. <laughs> so we begin with the letter S, and that simply stands for sow. The seed doesn't do anyone any good as long as it sits on the shelf. In order for the seed to do its work, you have to get it in the ground. Think about God's word, also referred to as a seed. But it will not do you or anyone else any good 
until you get it in the soil of your heart. You need to listen to it. You need to consider it. You need to reflect upon it. Let it find its way into the soil of your heart, and then it will produce whatever it promises. But as long as the Bible sits on your nightstand collecting dust, it will not do you or anyone else any good. And with money, it won't help others, and it will not be multiplied back to you until you give it or until you sow it. Look at these verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10. Still referring to the offering. He said, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. The Father will supply bread for food but he also supplies something else. And in the sequential order, it says he supplies the other thing first. He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Yes. But see what a lot of people do, they'll take the seed that he supplies to sow and they turn it into food as well. They consume it all upon themselves. God gives seed to the sower before he provides the seed that is turned into bread for food. I want you to think about that. God provides seed for the sower. You know, when I moved back to California <clears throat> from Oregon, this is probably 1978 maybe, um, I started going to a church here in the Southland and they had a, a project that they, they engaged with that had to do with a parking lot. And I know how important parking is for a church. It's really, really important. In fact, some of you remember if you've been with us since the Sausalito campus, we used to bus people from three remote locations every service. In fact, at one point, we bus people in from five locations, and we had buses that came every five minutes there, and we always had like a captain of the bus that was sort of like the guy in the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland. We'd crack jokes and hand out candy and you know, just sort of make it a fun little thing so people would, you know, park at different schools, at different locations, and we'd have to bus them in. So parking is important. So they've got this project, you know, to, to get this parking lot, and it's going to cost $60,000. And I thought, man, I want to I be in on this. This is important for the, the future and the life of the church. And I prayed, and I felt like the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to give $100. Now, in 1978, $100 was a lot of money to me, especially at that time because I didn't have hardly anything. I'd just come back from Oregon. I, I was out of work. I got a job shortly after that, but at the, the moment, I didn't have a job. And I'd had to sell a guitar just to get gas money to come back. All I had was $10. I had one $10 bill. And I felt like this, the Spirit had said to me, give 100 And so I prayed about it and thought about it, and I thought about these very verses we're looking at that he multiplies the seed that we sow. And so I did something. I got an envelope and I addressed it to an evangelistic association that was doing an amazing work with evangelism globally. And I know you're not supposed to put cash in the mail, but I put the $10 bill in there, sealed it, put a stamp on it, sent it off in the mail. I said, God, you multiply the seed that I sow. And you know what, that same day, I got a letter in the mail. There was no return address on it. No idea who sent it. I opened it up, and there were 10 $10 bills in the envelope. Oh, yeah. Listen, no human being on earth knew what the Holy Spirit had put on my heart to do. No human being on planet Earth other than myself knew what I had done with the $10, knew about the prayer that I had prayed. I mean, those things must have crossed in the mail. And I opened it up, so I just, I happily, next service, you know, went to church and gave the $100 for the parking lot. You see, he multiplies the seed that we sow. And from that day, the cycle has continued and the amounts have grown, and the fruits have increased. So S stands for sow your seed, get it in the ground, so God can begin multiplying it. 
And then E, our second letter, stands for eternal life. The bottom line is we give so that people can experience eternal life and all of its benefits. That is the why we give. Every single part of it. It's about bringing eternal life to people that are lost. It's about bringing all the benefits that Christ died to provide to people that need God in their life. And that is the why that we give so people can receive this amazing gift of God's grace. You know, I spoke to a young man in church here a few days ago. He got saved at Cottonwood, been saved less than a year, and it's always a trip to talk to him. He has this, this holy sense of being just thunderstruck with this new life that he has. There's this holy sense of, of awe as he continually discovers more about this Savior that has so radically changed his life. And, you know, I look at him and I just, I, I smile. It's delightful and it's something that none of us should ever lose as Christians. But the fact is that that young man and thousands of others like him, they are the fruits of righteousness of people that have given into the mission here at Cottonwood Church. They are fruit that abounds to your account if you have supported the mission of this house. Him and thousands others just like him. You know, I got saved at a street mission in Medford, Oregon. I was uh, an alcoholic at the time. I had a severe problem with substance abuse. Had a whole lot of problems going on. And I got radically saved in this little street mission. But you know what, I'm smart enough to know that that never would have happened if somebody hadn't been generous. Somebody gave. They paid for the lights to be on. They paid the gas bill. They paid the electric bill. They paid the water bill. They paid the salaries. They paid the rent on the building. People brought food so that they could feed, you know, the homeless people that were there. That never would have happened. You know, that, that encounter I had in that place, if somebody hadn't been generous. I am the fruit of someone's generosity. And that has perpetuated itself and it has had a rippling effect that has gone on and on. And we come to the the third letter, it's another E, and that one stands for expectancy. And there's a bit of divine tension with this one. You see, our motive for generosity should be love and obedience, never to get. We ought to give because we love God and because we love a world that Christ died to save and we do it out of obedience because God said to be generous. We are to imitate him as dear children and he is the most generous being in existence. And so we we give out of a motivation of love and out of a motivation of obedience, but the fact is, God always rewards generosity. We don't give to get in order to consume it upon ourselves, but we should expect the promised harvest. Hence, you know, a bit of divine tension. Now, if there were no promised benefit, we should give generously just the same. Out of gratitude and out of a desire to do the will of God and see people's lives changed. But you know, God in his wisdom and in his kindness has set a law into motion that as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. And as 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 clearly teach, that applies to the financial gifts we sow into God's work as well. So I believe that even though it is not our motive for giving, we should give with expectancy in anticipation of a harvest. I mean, what what farmer would plant seeds and not expect a harvest? You know, we take Janet's family, you know, as an example once again, her, her dad raising all of those kids on a small dairy farm. They planted their wheat, they planted their oats, they planted their corn. And you know, in advance of the harvest, they made sure the tractor was in good working order. They made sure the corn picker was working. They made sure the corn chopper was working. They they had a barn built in advance. 
They had a huge silo that they would store the grain in. I mean, what farmer would plant a crop of corn and then go, what the heck? That stuff is growing. Man, we got to get a tractor. Let's get a contractor out here and build us a silo. No, they have enough faith in the soil and in the seeds and in all the elements that are involved that they prepare in advance. They sow their seed and they, they have an anticipation that there will be a harvest. You know, many years ago, our church was on Catella Avenue, so we were actually on Catella Avenue before we were on Catella Avenue. And uh, we had a, a, a small commercial office building leased out. We were there for five years. And we, we seated 160 people, and I say that with a, a bit of a grin, because that meant we seated people outside as well. Some, when it was hot or raining, we'd just give them umbrellas, and we'd pipe the sound out there. And uh, we'd seat them down the hallways, you know. I mean, if you went to the bathroom, there was nothing private about it, because there were people down the hallways with chairs, and sound is piped in there. If I took one step backwards, I crashed into the drum set. If I took two steps forward, I was in the lap of the people in the front row. I mean, it was tight. You couldn't breathe in that place. We were packed in like sardines, and we ran 600 people in that tiny little place. We so desperately needed a bigger facility. And we had tried and tried, and everything had fallen through, and we'd been saving and had a building fund saved. And it just, I mean, just nothing was working. And in prayer one day, I felt like God challenged me, again, with these verses, that he multiplies the seed that we sow. And I felt like God was telling me that we needed to give a major portion of our building fund away. So I called the board together, and we got our leadership team together and told them what I felt like God had told me. And to the person, every one of them, had a witness in their heart. We said, they said, we believe the Holy Spirit's in this. We need to do it. Floated the idea to the congregation. Almost unanimously, everybody said, we should do it. I say almost. There was a few people that were in direct opposition to that. In fact, after service, as I was greeting people at the door, several of them pulled me aside, and they said, we think you're a fool. He says, we haven't been able to get a building. We've been saving this building fund, and now you're giving it away. How do you ever expect us to get a building? And they basically said, look, we, we're not going to be shepherded by a fool. We're gone. And they left the church and never, ever came back. But you know what? Within just a few short weeks of that, and we gave $50,000 to different ministries around the world that were doing great works for God, and that was a huge part of our building fund at the time. Within a few short weeks of that, the property over in Sausalito opened, and God did miracle after miracle, after miracle, after miracle. I wish I had the time to go through the story, but we ended up getting that property and building that building. And without the help of God, it never would have happened. Now, we didn't give to get, but God multiplies the seed that we have sown. And so when we give, we should give in anticipation of a harvest. <clears throat> R-I-D stands for do it now. And by now, I mean out of what you have presently, not waiting until you have more before you participate. Do it now. Listen to these verses from the same section of chapters we're studying. The subject is still the offering they're receiving. Look at 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 10. He writes to them and said, and here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not an according to what he does not have. If there's a readiness to give, a willingness, it's acceptable, meaning it's acceptable to God according to what one has, not according to what you don't have. Now that can be looked at two ways. First, God is not expecting you to give something you don't have. We give according to our means, even as the verse declared. 
But there's a second way that I believe it needs to be looked at, and I think the implication is most definitely there. That if there's first a willingness to participate, it's only acceptable with God according to what you have, not what you don't have. In other words, somebody says, man, well, if I won the lottery, pastor, I'm telling you, I, I, I'd give half of it to the church. That's awesome, but it's not acceptable. Why? Because you didn't win the lottery. <laughs> well, if I got an inheritance, I guarantee you that the church would be the first, you know, beneficiary. Not acceptable. It's not accepted according to what you don't have. Well, if I had a million dollars, oh, I would give generously to the church. Well, it's great that you're willing, but it's not acceptable with God. It's only acceptable with what you have now. You know, I had the privilege many years ago to speak at a conference with Dr. E.V. Hill. Those of you who knew that the late Dr. Hill knew he was a, a fabulous preacher. He and I spoke together at a conference in Anaheim. He was on first, and I followed him. And he shared a story that these two sisters began attending his church. They were new to the church, and they put a check in the offering for $1 billion. Now, he didn't know them, but it got his attention. You can do a lot for the kingdom with a billion dollars. And he didn't know maybe they were from old money or something, and so he, he you know, arranged a meeting with these two sisters, and he put the check down. He says, look, Girls, is, is this legitimate? And they said, oh, no, pastor, we don't have the money. We just wanted you to know that if we did have it, we would be willing. <laughs> Not acceptable. <laughs> what is acceptable with God is being generous out of what you have now. Dear friend, I hope you take to heart what you just heard, and I pray that you would become generous right where you are now out of what you have now, whether it's little or it's much. Be generous with others the way the Lord has been generous with you. You'll find a blessing in it. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's Word in our daily lives. The rain just won't stop. I wish I could turn it off. I can't turn off the rain, but I can protect myself from it. It's the same with temptations. We can't switch them off, but we can protect ourselves. Pastor Bayless explains how in his CD or DVD message, Victory Over Sin. God will not leave you out in the rain. Grab the right umbrella and step into the good life already prepared for you by God, a life free from feelings of powerlessness and shame. Order Victory Over Sin by Pastor Bayless Conley now. Just use the information on screen victory over sin. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.